It should be fairly evident at this point that people move for all kinds of reasons. Most certainly I've interviewed people who've moved for love and those who've moved for a sense of adventure and even individuals who've moved as a matter of self-care. But I'm pretty sure the most common reason I've heard has been because of employment and career. And for that reason, Vanessa Arnold is no different. As you've already probably figured out by this point, no one person's story is truly typical. The New York native has been living in Berlin, Germany now for over a decade, where she relocated to put her linguistics degree to work. She's also a cross-cultural kid whose upbringing was partially influenced by her mother's Trini background, as well as her dad's, who hails from North Carolina. And in this episode, we discuss how some of her early cultural observations she developed visiting both places as a child would prepare her for her eventual life abroad. Vanessa explains how she unexpectedly pursued that linguistics degree and how she ended up in Germany as a result. She shares the challenges of trying to navigate a new country when you don't know the language, the people, and have limited connections. She also describes the differences she experiences as being a dark-skinned black woman in Berlin versus her time in New York. This is Vanessa's story on this episode of The Global Channel. We're back with the latest episode of Global Chatter. Of course, it's early in the morning, and I apparently don't record with anyone who is behind me in time zone, but I am excited to welcome Vanessa Arnold to the latest recording. How are you, Vanessa? I am doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I love it. You look straight to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't... You're like, I'm good. I'm here. It is what it is. Man, look, I know our discussion is going to be awesome, partially because we need awesome people to come on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so, so I, this is going to be a fun, fun discussion um, because I, I can't wait to sort of hear your perspective, especially as a woman who is currently living in Europe. And, and there's been, I think, a lot of, there's a lot going on on, on your side of the Mm-hmm. So uh, tell everyone where you're currently located. I'm currently lo- located in Berlin, Germany, and I've been here since 2010. Okay, so that, at this point, you're like an OG. If you've been there since 2010, that's a long time. Uh-huh, yes. Girl, don't make me feel old. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you said it, and, that, and the rest of us didn't know. If you said you got there last year, we'd be like, oh, wow, she got there during COVID. Which some people moved during COVID, wow. by the way, which is right. I uh, I know a couple people that moved two or three times during Ooh. COVID, which is, it wasn't easy, but they made it happen. I, you know, I like to do this with every guest because I, I think it's important to set up context. So let's start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? Well, I was born and raised in New York City. And I lived there until I was 21, 22. And then I moved wow. out to California. What part of New York did you grow up in or what part of the city? Queens. Rather? Good old Queens. Rego Park. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me be very specific. She's like, she's born in Queens. Okay. So is your family still in Queens? No. Now my family is spread out all over the U.S. I mean, I still have some family in New wow. York, but not in Queens, actually. My family is in Brooklyn. The rest of my family is in Brooklyn. It's really fascinating. Like, so... I always think this is really his- interesting with anyone's story. Obviously, prior to you moving, had your family been in New York City for a really long time? Like, was it the kind of thing where your grandmother grew up in New York City or your, you know, your great grandparents or your parents? Or did they move there from somewhere else? Yeah, my dad moved from Wilmington, North Carolina in the 70s. Hey, hey. hey, hey. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom moved from Trinidad and Tobago also in the 70s and they met at church in New York. Okay, and, th- and there's a reason why I asked that question because I think particularly when you look at the stories of, of, of Black folks in the U.S., right? There's there's a lot of migration. Yes. There's a lot of migration. Yeah. I think in, in the histories, right? 
And I find New York, especially I find the North really fascinating, right? Because when I ask more war questions, then you find out, well, at least one member of the family came from somewhere in the South, which is to be expected. And then with New Yorkers, it's interesting. The more and more I ask, at least someone came from the Caribbean mm-hmm. <laughs> or Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, yeah. So, so early family years, early life years were spent in New York. And so what, what did, did you go to college in New York as well? I did. I did my bachelor's at the city university of New York. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then did you grow up traveling? We did not internationally, but we grew up traveling around the country for sure. I mean, we always had to visit the family in North Carolina, my grandparents. Mm-hmm. And then we, most of the family from the Caribbean would come to visit us, but we went at least once or twice to Trinidad. Yeah. Interesting. So let's, let's kind of unpack that for a little bit. I, and I'm going to start with maybe it's the easier one. Obviously you grew up in New York mm-hmm. coming down to North Carolina. Cause I've said this about this country. This country is big and there's a lot of different cultures. Was there a culture shock for you coming to North Carolina, even though it's still on the East Coast of the States? Yes. I'll give you two adjectives. <laughs> Slow and boring. <laughs> I mean, I think New York is very loud. It's slightly obnoxious. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell me more. What do you mean by slow and boring? I mean, like, okay, yeah. this is from a kid's perspective. So, you know, imagine you're 9, 10, and you have to go visit your grandparents who are in their 70s, and you're going to Wilmington, North Carolina, coming from New York City. So this is just a mm-hmm. different world. You know, everything's just slower and not much to yeah. do like there is in New York, not much to see. And so that was <laughs> always not the most exciting trip for us. But yeah, definitely a, a bit of a culture shock if you will okay so then let's compare that at what age did you do you remember going to trinidad the first time i went i was about five okay yeah did you go when you were a little bit older 19 (laughs) okay i mean that's a gap (laughs) so then let's let's see can you remember your memories from going when you were five i do yeah because i turned five there oh okay So what was it like the first time you remember going to Trinidad? Hot, humid mosquito bites <laughs> that I still have scars from. That sounds, that sounds like Wilmington. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. For those of y'all who don't know, Wilmington is also by the coast. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm like, that sounds like Wilmington. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and just a lot of family. I have, my mom had six brothers and sisters. So I have a lot of cousins. It was just family, 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 eating food, fun, lots of laughter, fun. And then at 19, was that a family trip or you went by yourself? It was a family trip with my parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how was that experience different? Obviously you're older. So was it did you see, was there a different feeling when you went that? There was a big difference. We stayed with my aunt both times but this time was the first time that I realized that my aunt had no running water. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that the first time. I missed time. that the first time. <laughs> Somehow that escaped my notice. And so this trip, the last trip was definitely difficult for me. Yeah. Okay. And set this up for me because I know what no running water looks like in sub-Saharan Africa. Is it that then she had a well, is it that sense of go be carried from a river or a lake or oh, like, yeah. what does this mean then if you need water? I think it was a, a, a well or some kind of pump or something that she had mm-hmm. that we'd have to use. And then we'd have to heat the water up to take a bath or yeah, a bath basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I was on, this is, funny i was on twitter the other day and uh so when, well there's a lot of funny things that were being said but uh somebody called i forgot the reason was but the term plantain delegation was being used and it was really funny because it was basically uniting all these people who wrote the country said people okay but more importantly someone put in in this twitter chat you know, this photo of a bucket with water and a smaller bucket. And all of a sudden, everyone who'd ever grown up doing bucket showers was like, 
united around this photo. <laughs> and so that's what I was sort of thinking when you're yeah. saying, yeah, we had to, we had water from a well, which I'm like, ooh, so you didn't have to carry it. Okay. I mean, you had to carry it, but you had a well, mm-hmm. and then you had to boil it. That kind of reminded me of some experiences in Cameroon. Because mm-hmm. sometimes people find this too when they meet up with cousins who live in different parts of the world. What was your interaction with your cousins as a 19 year old? Because I'm, in many ways, I guess you're sort of the American mm-hmm. if most of them were still in, in, in Trinidad. Mm-hmm. And so what was, what were those interactions like? I think they were kind of, in awe, not in awe, but, you know, kind of like, oh, cool, the American's here. And, you know, almost like, let's show her what we got. You know, we got the same stuff y'all got. And, you know, in the States, we got it down here too, you know. Yeah. A little bit of that going on. Yeah. Did you feel that there was, um, I I mean, I think this might not be the right word, but did you feel like there was maybe sometimes a little bit of a cultural disconnect because, I think when you grow up kind of biculturally, because mm-hmm. I, I would imagine your mom had a lot of her Trini influences in your house. Yes. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> and so, yeah. and, 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 and here's what I think is interesting about people who grew up in New York City too, right? There's so many different cultures around, mm-hmm. right? So I imagine growing up as a kid, you knew other, and I'm just going to hyphenate for, for simplicity's sake, Trini Americans or Caribbean Americans, yeah. right? Did, so so you weren't segregated or separated from that culture. So I'm curious about when you went and visited, did the, like, was there still a little bit of a disconnect where you're like, man, I am American <laughs> compared to, like, I'm Trini, but I'm... Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm just curious about that. Because, I mean, in many ways, you were a cross-cultural yeah. kid. Like, you grew up. So did you ever, when you, were you very aware of your Americanness when you were in Trinidad? Yes. As a 19 19- Yes. It was difficult staying in the house with no running water. And there was just a lot of, uh, how can I say this? A lot of things that you're used to that make life so comfortable in the U.S. that I was like, oh, I can't handle this. Can't deal with it. Mm-hmm. Spoiled American. I almost felt like that. What was that show? That Paris Hilton show with that. Um, oh, the were they the, were in the wild or something or something life. The the oh my god, it's at the tip of my tongue. It was Y'all celebrity life. Like, I don't know. No, oh gosh, that and I literally just watched. I listened to a podcast <laughs> on this. But you know what I mean. That show, yeah. Right. I, I almost felt like I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. A little bit like that. Really? Yes. yes. Yeah. And. Yeah, that's when I realized I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm American. Here's the funny part. I think we don't, when you're around people who are kind of like you, you don't realize how much you're something until you're. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and I think this is especially interesting with, with, with folks like you who, once again, you grew up with more than one culture in, in the home. And when you then get into that main culture, <laughs> you realize there are certainly elements of me that are this, but then you also mm-hmm. go, ooh, some of this is very like through the lens of where you grew up in your case in the States. And so, but I, I you know, having a Trini mom, I assume that though she was making, first of all, did your mom cook? I just don't she want to sure did. She, okay. she sure did. Yeah. Okay. Because I don't. <laughs> Because I don't want to be like, did your mom cook? And you'd be like, no. So I was assuming she's making Trini food in the house, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then when you're going to your aunt's or you're, you're in Trinidad, still you're already familiar, yes. right? The food is great. Okay. That mm. part. That part. <laughs> that part mm-hmm. stayed. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes food also becomes American eyes. This is true. <laughs> this is true. But in New York, you have, yeah. I mean, everybody. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so have you been back to Trinidad since you left at that age? I haven't. I haven't. Um, yeah. Cause I've been here and I just haven't been able to get, yeah, sadly. I mean, and you're far, I mean, you're farther <laughs> away. Like it's not, it's one thing if you're in the States, but I think you're in Europe. So that's a special yeah. trip. And so, so tell me a little bit about college then you went out, you stayed in New York to go mm-hmm. to college, mm-hmm. correct? What did you study at the undergrad level? Criminology. <laughs> All right. As someone who works in higher ed and a career counselor, I'm very fascinated. 
why <laughs> I have some theories, but I want to, I wanted to hear why you study pathology. Not that you should study it, but random. I know. I don't like school, and I felt like okay, if I'm going to do this thing, this bachelor's thing, I want to study something that I've never studied before. So no history, no math, no science, no. I want to do something completely different and new. And I love okay. crime books, Agatha Christie, John Grisham, uh, Mary Higgins Clark. Uh-huh. All of this was always my favorite genre. So I thought, I wonder if I can study this. And so I looked it up and I was like, mm. oh, shoot, I can. Got it. We're good to go. Fascinating. You know why I asked is that, okay, so when I got students who were criminology, criminal justice majors at the universities I've worked in, usually there's a, that, that, that is the first time I've heard all of that, to be honest, because usually the component is somehow, some way, some member or someone close to them had got caught up in the criminal system, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Or, or they are former military kind of law enforcement background, okay. yeah. making a transition. And then we started to see the rise of this, like, whew mid 2000s late 2000s really where because of all the law and order and criminal intent and all of that everybody and their mom wanted to be a forensic scientist and then they didn't realize the extent of science that's in forensic science like you don't you don't just walk up and look at a body and be like this is this this happened it's like no it's a lot of Mm -hmm. chemistry and bio (laughs) bio Mm biochem and and whatnot And then, of course, I, I, where I went to undergrad, criminology was kind of tucked under sociology. Yeah. So there were people kind of just in yeah. that, that. So so you studied this. My question is that what did you think you were going to do with, <laughs> with it? Yeah, funnily enough that you mentioned those shows. I've never been into any of those shows, had never seen them because everyone was like, oh, do you know CSI? And I was like, nope heard of it oh yeah never seen it right (laughs) yeah i had a few things i actually wanted to be an fbi profiler that Mm. that was that just sounded fascinating to me or maybe law Uh, if you know that didn't work out fbi but i just i thought oh fbi agent (laughs) (laughs) obviously you didn't become an fbi agent no so i'm trying to or am i so what happened (laughs) or i mean you could be (laughs) I mean, it's possible, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> All right. I was. I mean, would you tell me exactly. if you were and you were undercover? No, <laughs> right. So, so what? I mean, anything possible. So you thought you were going to do that because here's here's what I'm I'm trying to get at. Um, you study this degree, but then you go on to get a master's in linguistics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kid, you walk me through how you landed on linguistics. <laughs> okay, so third year of BA bachelor's, I was like, ooh, this is depressing. And I don't <laughs> it's criminology. Yeah. What do you think? I don't know. I just thought it'd be, you know. <laughs> but when you think about how messed up the criminal justice system is in the States, I just was like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. I'm not cut out for this. Right. And so I was thinking of switching, and my sister, who's older than me, she was like, You have one more year. Just finish it, get out and do something different for your master's. So I was like, okay. All right. So I finished. And then, like I said, I moved out to California and I went to like a, um, like a two year Bible kind of thing program in between. And so after that I graduated, I finished. And then I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do now career wise? And my father was a teacher and I said, I'm never going to be a teacher not doing it. Don't like kids. Not happening. And then someone was like, well, uh, people have always told me you'd be a really good teacher. You should go into teaching. I was like, no, I don't like children. They were like, well, you can teach adults. And I was like, oh, yeah. Okay. (laughs) You went to college. You can't teach adults. (laughs) I'm sorry. I, like I said, I, y'all hear me talk about being a career counselor all the time. I just see the funniest things that people say and go, uh, it's right there. Okay. <laughs> um, so you find out you can teach adults and then what happens? Well, what could I possibly do? And then someone was like, what about English as a second language? And I was like, oh, yeah, I huh. really like English. I love languages. 
let me look into it. But stupid Vanessa didn't. I was like, what do I need to study for that? I don't know. Someone else was like linguistics. And I was like, not sure. I know that's languages, but I don't, I speak one language. I studied Spanish in school, but that doesn't count. So I was like, oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> So then I started researching and looking and then I was like, oh, this is another one of those things that I never learned about in school. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I wow. like it. I mean, I want to pause for a second because we'll get to the linguistics in a moment. You're a New Yorker who moved to California. Culture shock? Yes. Yes. What part of California? Long Beach, California, which is... You know, yeah. Long Beach, California is Long Beach, California. <laughs> I was about to start rapping Snoop Dogg. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's the first thing. That's Sorry. the first thing, right? Y'all get, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not about to get down here. But, uh, yeah, they're in my head. I was like, hey. <laughs> Never been to Long Beach, but I do know those. <laughs> exactly. Know Snoop and Dr. Dre. Anyway, exactly. yes. That's the first thing I think most people think of. But there's actually... <laughs> nice parts of long beach surprisingly. yeah yeah of course so and long beach is actually mostly white and the university that i went to cal state long beach is mostly white yeah. so that was a that was a different it just wasn't as urban it was just right. different yeah no and i would say that because I, I the reason i mentioned that is that for 20 21 years you've been in new york city which is one of the most diverse places on the planet Right? Yeah. Not even just in the U.S., not yeah. even North America, yeah. but in on the planet. And yeah. then to go, it's almost like I feel like anywhere else you go, it, it's not going to be as get any kind of mix of folks that you want to get. Right. Mm-mm. So you're out. You're out in California. You decided to study linguistics, and this was really because you found out that one. Well, you already knew you had a love of languages, and two. You can educate folks, not necessarily children. Is that kind of where your your mind was at? Yeah. And also I thought, what can I do and travel? I want to work and travel at mm. the same time. So that's another option. Did you growing up or in college have an interest in being abroad or tra- like, was that part of your, did you see that's part of your identity? Because I know for some folks, that's not necessarily until they got older. Yes. I mean, I always dreamed of going abroad and and going to different countries and doing a study abroad. Couldn't afford it. But that was, there was always that desire to do that. Gotcha. Okay. So then I I guess then it makes sense sort of pursuing a linguistics degree because some component of it was going to take you internationally. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this, so tell, for folks who don't really understand, what is linguistics? Like, what are you studying if this is the degree that you Yeah. The first question I always get when I tell people I've studied linguistics is how many languages do you speak? And I'm like, no, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) It's not what you think. It's really just the study of language in general, how languages work, how they're developed, how they're learned in general. I mean, language is a human thing. It's unique to humans. So there's a kind of, you can study language in a general sort of sense. Um, so that's really what it is, the sounds and language, uh, how they develop words, you know, discourse, communication. Yeah. And, and I mean, going into it, you obviously English is your first language and you had some Spanish from probably what, high school, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, mm-hmm. maybe in college or no, not in college. I think I took a course, maybe. College. Maybe one. Yeah. But but you were, you wouldn't necessarily consider yourself at least at the time bilingual. No. <laughs> Okay. I'm not even close. close. I, I wish. People are. I wish. Oh. And I mean, and even studying linguistics, I'm really, I'm just, you know, I always love to highlight stuff that people, particularly black and black and brown folks, don't think about. But even in your linguistic courses, was it a diverse program, or were you one of the handful, or one of few, or one of the only people of color in your program? I wasn't. You had quite a, I well no okay not a quite a number I had some friends from Iran and oh, cool. uh Iran and Syria and there were a number from the far east as well from Korea from Japan mm-hmm. some from South America it was a good mix it pulled some oh, international sweet. people yeah 
But I, so then I'm hearing from that, but probably it seemed like very few black folks were part of it. There were no black folks. I was the only black person in my program. There was also one black professor and that was it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was diverse in terms of kind of all these different kids that they represented, Mm -hmm. but in terms of if we drill it down to maybe black folks, that it was not for them. It was just me. Wow. Mm -hmm. So then you get this linguistics degree. I mean, like anything else, generally speaking, you get a degree and you want to use it. Did you think then at the completion of this degree you were going to go abroad or were you just like, I need to find something right now and this will be kind of a key thing that I go? A mix of both. (laughs) (laughs) I need to find something now and or it'll happen in the future. Yeah. I mean, so what did you... What did you do? Like, you get this linguistics degree. Because here's, here's the thing. Like, I look at resumes all the time. Some degrees you have to explain to people, right? Especially mm-hmm. if you're looking for a job. So what did you what did you do? I looked for a job immediately locally. So in the Los Angeles area. I just wanted to start teaching. Because going abroad, first of all, okay, I wanted to go abroad, but I was pretty specific of, to, I wanted, I didn't want to go This sounds bad, but let me explain why. I didn't want to go to the Far East. So a lot of people go to Korea and Japan to teach English. And I didn't want to do that because I felt it would be too far, as a literally too far, but also uh, culturally too far. And so I thought I had my eyes kind of set on Europe and everybody was like, no, can't go. You can't get a visa as American. So I was like, well, okay, then I guess I'll try to find a job here and see what happens in the future? No, and I, I, I mean, here's the thing. I don't, I don't think it's just like a bad thing. I think all of us have our strengths and weaknesses, and there are just some places culturally that are easier for some of us to adjust to and assimilate to, and and some that are hard. Like I, I think it's, I think it's unrealistic for folks. I, I always say this to folks: like it's unrealistic to assume just because you want to go abroad, everywhere is going to be a good fit for you. That's not true. Yeah. And I know sometimes people are scared to say that because like, well, it's, it, it doesn't mean that you're biased or you're prejudiced. You yeah. know what I mean, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean you dislike a group of people. Right. It's just some cultures. I mean, and especially if you're like North American, right? I'm like, if it makes it easier for you and like, especially if you're American, just think to yourself, the U.S. is big and probably has about 10 cultures going on regionally, right? Mm-hmm. There's some you would not live in. Mm-hmm. And you American. So it's okay to say yeah. there's some parts of the world I would love to visit. Yeah. I'll eat your food because yep. your food's amazing. Yep. But I can't live there. Yeah. So your first immediate job, was it was it in then in the LA area or were mm-hmm. you able to get something abroad? No, I found a job. It was kind of like a part-time thing teaching English at some private language school. And then how long was it between you being in LA and completion of your degree, and then you got to go to Germany. Like, how did you end up in Europe finally? Mm -hmm. It was about a year and I had been, okay. So I was like, if I'm going to Europe, I'm going to Spain, I'm going to Italy, you know, the, you know, the romantic countries. Of course. (laughs) Of course. Nobody wants to go to Germany. And they're both amazing. They're both amazing. I've been to both and I'm like, yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So I was like, oh, and I speak some Spanish, you know. <laughs> you speak no Spanish. <laughs> you said that. <laughs> Sorry. No. Not to kill the dream. You know what I said? I was not the bilingual, but okay, go ahead. But we can go explore a Spanish. Go ahead. <laughs> I, had to, I had to psych myself up a little bit, you know. All right, of course. <laughs> so, right. So I was heading to th- those places. I had some friends in Madrid and they were like, yeah, you can do this, the, that, and the other. First of all, there was a guy in exchange, a Fulbright scholar in my program from Germany. And he was like, oh, you could get a job in Germany. And I was like, oh, what? Who? Say what now? Yeah. It's real easy. So I was like, okay, let me start researching that. Then I had, from that Bible school that I was in, I had a friend of mine who was in Berlin at the time. And through some mutual friends, they were like, you know, she's in Berlin, right? And I was like, oh, no, mm -mm, didn't know. But okay, cool. So I contacted her and she was like, I have an apartment here that you can come and live in. So I was like, wow. Oh, okay. Then okay. I had some miles <laughs> from a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> so you you got free housing and you found an opportunity. And now we're on how to play, pay for the plane ticket. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So cool. those miles came into 
got me here, got me a one-way ticket. Not a round trip <laughs> ticket, but a one-way ticket. Oh. <laughs> the number of stories I've heard of people who are like, I have a one-way ticket. I Part of the reason they didn't have a round, round trip ticket because they didn't have the money to give me that. So it's sort of like, this country has to work out because I don't know how to give that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so what, what, what year was this then that put you on your way to Germany? This is 2010. 2010. So that's, that's the start of the over a decade mm-hmm. that we led with. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So here's, here's what I'm excited to do. We're going to go to break, but then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about then what your experiences have been living, particularly as a, as a black woman and as an American in Germany, mm-hmm. especially as someone where this is truly has been your first and only overseas living and 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 get some of your advice from from what you've learned so hang on with us and we'll be back after the break mental wellness is a big part of a successful expat experience whether you're going abroad for a short stint or making the move long term this is why you should visit the international therapist directory it provides online listings of professional mental health therapists who are familiar with the expat as well as the third culture kid life With over 250 members in more than 35 different countries, this resource lists therapists, counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists interested in providing culturally sensitive, cross-cultural treatment and care for today's expat community. Visit internationaltherapistdirectory.com to find out more about this global therapy resource. All right, so we're back after the break. And if you remember from the first half, Vanessa was taking us to, to the point where she got to Germany or at least was on her way with them with the miles and points that she had to be able to buy a ticket. Which by the way, I just want y'all to know during the break we did figure out that that Paris Hilton show, it is a simple life because if I don't say that it's mm-hmm. gonna really annoy me. <laughs> so O C D. So yes, that was the show. Not that we're plugging it because it's been off the air for at least 14 years at this point, but still, yeah. for those of you who wanted to know what show we were referring to. But all right, so we at this point is 2010, and Vanessa is, let's just say she's in Germany. Did you land in Berlin or did you land somewhere else? I did. Okay. In Berlin. I, mm-hmm. Berlin, by the way, Berlin is on my bucket list for two reasons. One, I hear it's cool. And also, um, because the only place I've been to in Germany, and it doesn't really count because I haven't done proper German travel, is Frankfurt because Lufthansa. And so there was a lot of transiting in, 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 in Frankfurt. Mm-hmm. And secondly, which I don't even think they're German and this has nothing to do with it. But there was a band in the 80s called Berlin. <laughs> and I thought that it was such a cool day. <laughs> You know that song "Take My Breath Away" from Top Gun, yes, right? Top Gun. Right? Yes. <laughs> Plug out that uh, there's a new Top Gun coming out. But anyway, yes, like I was like Berlin is such a cool name, and then and then I meet all these people who lived in Berlin and have just really interesting experiences. And so, all right, you land in Berlin, and at this point, you've never lived abroad. So, what what was that like? Those first few days, hours, weeks. I had never been to Germany before I had come. So there's that. I did not speak a word of German, could not even identify it as a language if I had heard it on the street. There's that. So this was like a constant. I remember landing, getting picked up, and then wanting to go and get some water. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I don't even know how to say water in this language. How am I going to do this? Now, my parents had come at the time because my parents like to travel and so they came, they were here at the same time. So we kind of all met up in Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> they were actually here before I landed. That is unusual. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They were like, oh, you're going to Germany? Well, our next trip will be Germany. Will be Germany. Wow. So that was scary. It was, that's the, the, the first word that comes to mind is scary. This is scary. I can't communicate with people. And Berlin is international mm-hmm. to a certain extent. I'm curious because... And you're right. Ber- Berlin is a major city. So this isn't like a small German village. No. You know how there are parts of the world where if you go there, there's a fair amount of English. So, mm-hmm. for example, if you go to the Netherlands and you go to Amsterdam or Leiden or somewhere, 
you can find quite a few people who speak English, right? And you can make it just fine. I mean, it, it, there's a learning curve, right? Because whatever, but there's, there's yeah. an amount of English. At the time you got to Berlin, was it the same way where there was a number of people who had learned English or spoke English that were around? Or was it really, or is it really one of those cities where you really need to know the national language <laughs> a lot more? Okay, there's a huge international community in Berlin. Huge. Yeah. So English, you can live here without speaking German, a hundred percent. However, if you want to do anything official, this is where you start to have a problem. And a lot of European countries, it's so that when you move, you have to register your address. Like you, you have to go to official, yeah. you know, and that those people who work there, the people who work for the IRS, the people who work at the visa office, they do not speak English. Mm-hmm. And so this is where you're like confronted with, oh, now I have a problem. So I can do, I can go to the grocery store maybe. Mm-hmm. But even that, actually, I find like a lot of people who work in the grocery store, uh, right. if they're past a certain age, not a chance. Right. So you can, but it's, I feel like then you always need someone to kind of help you out and be your translator. Right. I, I, you know, I, I don't know who I was talking. I think it was a friend. Cause I don't think it was on an interview, but I remember thinking, you know, especially for those of us who are English speakers, actually I'm reading this book and it's like, there's, <laughs> there's maybe 400 million of us who are native English speakers, right? The vast majority of the world is not, <laughs> it's not speaking. So if they speak English, they've had to learn it. But it's always funny how often, especially those of us who come from this side of the world, the Western side of the world or North America, want to go to places and are just shocked people don't speak English. And I'm thinking to myself, but like, they're not, in, like, they weren't colonized by the British and it's not, why would they speak English? <laughs> like, yeah, this is yeah. assumption. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so I, and I think it's fascinating because you, you, you know, you moved to a country and you didn't really know the language. And so, how long did it really take you or how did you navigate in those early months and early weeks, right? Because was it through your network of friends? Was it through people that you knew? Was it just in trial and error? Was it a combination of both? Like, how did you network? Because I think that's a fear for a lot of folks is, where do I go to a place that I can't communicate? Mm, yeah. You know, I was lucky I had that friend who was here. Mm-hmm. And she was a part of a larger Christian group here. So I got involved with that Christian group and that just expanded my network, I don't know, tenfold. And so that helped me a lot, but it was also trial and error and, you know, making mistakes, getting lost a lot in the city. Um, But I was also in my twenties at the time. And so this was just an adventure. This was just fun. It was exciting. And my parents supported me and they were like, if it doesn't work out, just come back home. So I had that all behind me. So I felt like I'm just going to try it and see what happens. And I think that's a really good point. I think um, the fact that you, you, well, there are two things. One is that you were able to find a network and support and also to look at it as an adventure. I think when people are thinking about going abroad, we want to plan everything out, which is fine. Like we want to have all the steps organized, mm-hmm. but then the reality is you never know what a country is going to throw at you because you've never lived there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like how would you, yeah. you don't know what to expect because you've never, especially if you've never been there prior to going. Yeah. And even if you yeah. have, like there are people who move to countries that they've been to prior and it's different, you know, visiting than living. It sure is. Yeah. And so, you know, what did you end up doing as far as, as far as supporting yourself, right? Like, was there a job laid out for you or how did you, how did you essentially make money? So the thing with Western Europe, that's very difficult because of the EU Mm -hmm. as an outsider or a non-EU national, you basically in language teaching, it's nearly impossible to get a job from abroad. You have to be here first. In other areas, engineering, computer, IT, they're looking for people. But in language teaching in particular, you really, you have to be here. And I tried applying for jobs from the States and they were like, great, let us know when you're here. Okay. Okay. That's different. Okay. Tell me more. So I had to wait till I got here and then start looking. And 
basically everything here, and I would say this is true for much of Western Europe, is freelancing. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And the catch-22 is you need a visa to work, right. even as a freelancer. Right. But in order to get that visa, you need yeah, a job. Well, right. Are you serious? No. And you know what? This is, I'm glad you made that distinction because there are other parts of the world, right? Like if you are looking to go to particularly Southeast Asia, as you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Parts of the Middle East and the Gulf as well, where you can apply for the job outside of the country, you know, and then move to Saudi, Korea, at least that used Mm -hmm. to be historical, like, right. And I know things are changing a little bit. And then be able to teach at a language school or some kind of academy. So I didn't realize with Western Europe, at least in what you're saying is they want you to actually move to the country first. I guess then how did you, because you weren't in the country, how were you able to get a visa to be in the country? Like, did you get a visa that authorized you to be able to work or did you just have a, like a tourist visa? And then we're like, I'm going to figure it out when I get there. Right. So as an American, you can come and stay for three months yep. before you have to leave. So within those three months, I had to get a visa that allowed me to work. And what they wanted was they wanted as a freelancer, you had to have at the time, I don't know if this is still true today. You had to have two letters from do, two different companies stating that they were willing to give you classes. Ah. So that's what I had to show up with. So I basically had to run around Berlin. I made a list in my little notebook. This was before smartphones, really. Right. Made a little list in my notebook and just went personally to every single language school that I could find and say, hi, I need a letter. <laughs> and I'd like to work for you. I'm an English teacher, you know. So that's what I did. Oh, my gosh. How many schools did it take before two said? I, the, first of all, I'm assuming someone said yes, right? Eventually. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cause I'm like, yes. <laughs> Because sometimes the story is like, actually, no one said yes. How 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 long did that, like, were there a lot of schools you had to visit? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got lost a lot. Um, Good way to learn Berlin, though. I bet you learned the city. I know. <laughs> Girl, I know it like the back of right. my hand. Okay. <laughs> look, look, my husband's German and he, I know the city better than he does. That's nice. Is, um, he-, <laughs> <laughs> is he from Berlin? No, but still. So. <laughs> it still sounds cooler anyway right. if I say I know it. But. <laughs> I don't remember how many schools it took, but it was a lot of walking. A lot of walking. <laughs> right. A lot of asking. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a number, a number, quite a number. Because you know what the thing is? Uh-huh. In the EU, they have all their British and Irish. And so they're uh, not desperate for American. native speakers anymore. Yeah. Those days are over. So, gotcha, gotcha, and I, yeah, no, and you know, we talked about this offline, which I thought was really interesting. So, like, you're right. If you are looking for English speakers, and you've got the originators of the language, <laughs> girl, being <laughs> sorry, I'm saying that like light bulbs going off. <laughs> I mean, it's great if an American shows up for the simple fact of you want an American, but if you just need someone to teach you the language go with the people whose language it is <laughs> yeah like whose language they think it is but right. yeah anyway so then i would imagine it creates a real difficulty for you as a non because you're a non-eu citizen or a non-eu resident at that point right so how were you able like you were able to find a job but like i just imagine that the competition is really high just because of course you could get you could get an english or an irish person Yeah. Yeah. I think one school, which I went to personally, I spoke to the woman. She was like, oh, this is interesting. And she looked at my CV and she was like, criminology. (laughs) She's like me. (laughs) (laughs) Who would have thought that this would come back to help me? And she was like, this, this sounds good. I like the combination of degrees. Really? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, she's like, we have some lawyers who need some English. You oh, know. okay, so that's like, fair. I was just like, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting. <laughs> yeah, you never know what's going to come back to help you. You never know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so yeah. did you stay with those early jobs or companies, or did you end up transitioning to other places? Yeah, I ended up leaving them eventually. My goal, actually, in coming to Europe, I wanted to teach at the university level. Okay. 
which is why I did the master's in the first place. Right. So that eventually, after about a year, I started to transition into university teaching as a freelancer. Okay. And so mm-hmm. here's where, where I, I always think it's really interesting. So let's do the backdrop of this. Obviously, this is you getting settled, getting a job, you know, learning your way around Berlin. I'm assuming picking up German as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mm-hmm. let me just go ahead and ask this off the bat. Are you bilingual at this point? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm just making sure. <laughs> I'm just making sure. It's okay if you said no, but it, you know. Just, you have to ask. She's like, I, I, ask, I, I yeah. can speak German. I'm good. And so yeah, yeah. But let, let's also let's also give context. So you're a young woman, probably in your 20s at this point, black woman, mm-hmm. grown up in a multicultural city. Let's look at it through that lens. What was mm-hmm. how was Germany different for you? Right. Because, you know, I, I went on a trip once. This was years ago. I went to uh, Italy and it was for it for academic purposes. And it was just real interesting to me with the young women that I was with, because they'd never really traveled before, how watching them see at least that part of Europe for the first time, because once again, grew up in the States, very North American, and just kind of assumed, honestly, I think because the US runs a certain way, and honestly, because there are white people in Italy, that it would run the same way. And then they realized these countries do not... (laughs) I was like, no. I was like, if you're looking for what kind of runs like the states, I'm thinking you're you're probably thinking more like Germany and like the Scandinavian countries because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the Mediterranean ones do not run like the U.S. So mm-hmm. what what was it like for you? What do you what was what was different? Mm-hmm. Just as even as a black woman, right, and as a young black mm-hmm. woman who'd never been there. Yeah, I think the most. The biggest difference for me was being the only black person. And I don't mean in, you know, like, for example, in my study program in linguistics, I was the only black person, but I mean, getting onto the subway and being the only black person in my little, you know, car Mm -hmm. on the subway or um, going into a store and no black people. Mm -hmm. This, I mean, as a New Yorker, this is right. What? So that was a big, big, big difference for me. I guess, how did you navigate that? Like, what was, I mean, let's kind of peel that back a little. Is it, is it because of the areas you were living? Was it because Berlin was not as diverse as maybe in New York or some other places? What sort of, just from a general context? You know, a lot of people, it's funny. They're like, well, you're from New York and Berlin's just like New York, isn't it? And I was like, you clearly have never been to New York because Mm -hmm. no, it's the Berlin is international for Germany. Mm. (laughs) But in terms of a global context, it's not international. Not really. I mean. Interesting. Say more. So for Germany, meaning tell for those who just never been to Germany. So I'll start by saying Berlin is not Germany. Berlin is like a separate country in and of itself. (laughs) Okay. It really is. It really is. If you've never been to any other place, but you've only been to Berlin, you've never been to Germany. So Germany is very white, very North European. Uh Uh-huh. Not a lot of Black people. The only Black people that tend to be here are Africans. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Germany colonized a little bit in Namibia and... um, Mm -hmm. Not Cameroon. I forgot the other country. Actually, oh. early on, see, fun history lesson. So they, did. they were. It, they're, okay, so it was named, Cameroon was named after by the Portuguese who misnamed it. They call it the lamb and the shrimp, but they were looking at crawfish. So that's one thing. And then, and then the, I know, everybody always rolls their eyes as soon as I say that part. <laughs> and then, the, <laughs> sorry, it's like the same reaction across the board. They're like, Oh, that's so, so bad. They, re, they were so wrong. Right, it is wrong, but it's the truth. And then, and then the Germans were there until World War One, mm-hmm, when they mm-hmm. lost. They lost, right? So then it became an English and and French territory, protect all of that mm-hmm. stuff, right? So mm-hmm. yes, no, the Germans were there for a hot minute. Anyway, continue. Okay, <laughs> they they had been in Africa. <laughs> they just lost, <laughs> right? So they so most of the black people here are. Uh, African. Mm-hmm. Now I've had in New York, I, I have, mm-hmm. I've had contact with a lot of friends, you know, but it's different. And that's when I realized, oh, we have the same skin color, mm-hmm. but we're different. We're not 
culturally, it's very different. I was like, this is actually bizarre. Actually, I laugh about this with my husband sometimes because actually my husband and I, who's white German, we are culturally closer than Mm -hmm. I am to an African. Mm -hmm. And that to me is mind boggling Mm because I'm like, this is insane. How can this, I would never have expected that. I just thought, you know, we're all black. It was all good, you know? So that was kind of shocking for me too, to realize, okay, wow, I really kind of am on my own here. You know? Mm I think, yeah. I mean, I think you bring up a really good point. I, I have, I have wondered, and I think part of it is the specific American experience, because I don't believe we allow for blackness and the multitude of blackness mm-hmm. cultures to rise to the top. So we just say you're black and that's supposed to be a blanket statement for Mm -hmm. black people who are in America. Right. But you just, even in our cold conversations, you being a black woman from New York city with someone who's a black person from Wilmington, North Carolina, with someone who's a black person from California, like Oakland area, right. From a black person from Chicago or Oklahoma, those are all different cultures. Mm-hmm. And just because we say you, bl- and, and then we do it with immigrants too, right? Because it doesn't actually matter where the immigrant comes from. Then we're just like, oh, you're black in America, right? And that's that whole the way the system is set up. So yeah. that I think that for some black Americans anyway, it's funny, like to your point, there's that conversation I've had with folks where they go somewhere else and then they realize, oh, wait, <laughs> we share skin tone, <laughs> but we have such different perspectives. Because we start mm-hmm. in different places, right? Mm-hmm. That yeah. doesn't that doesn't surprise me at all. Like that, to be yeah. honest, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, mm. and and how did you? I mean, you're people can't see you. You're a dark skinned woman, and I don't. Yeah, you know, and you present as a dark skinned woman. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember something you said a couple months ago that kind of stuck with me. That how much you in Germany were able to sort of embrace that identity more in oh, terms yeah. of your dark skin, like. Why do you think that was the case? Like, why? I think Germans don't expect, if you're Black, they expect your hair to have a certain texture. They expect you to have a certain skin color. And there's not this whole history that we have in the U.S. of having to straighten your hair. And like, I would have never gone out in the U.S. with my natural hair. Even the thought of it was, was not even thinkable but here people would ask me why is your hair straight (laughs) excuse me what did you just ask me why is my hair straight like why doesn't it look like the way it's supposed to look and that's when I started thinking "Hmm." Hmm. interesting question I don't know how to answer that (laughs) right isn't that a funny statement why does your hair look like the way it's supposed to look yeah Wow. So that's when I really started to feel like, I remember when I started growing out my relaxer and the first time I went out with my Afro and I just, nobody looked twice. You know, it was like, <laughs> nobody cared. <laughs> nobody cared. Like, Whatever. You know, and I was like, oh, this is new and different. <laughs> I mean, isn't that funny? Like I know black women, it seems like black women talk about their hair all the time, but I don't, I don't think people realize how it could be a political statement how it could be an emotional statement, how it is a reflection of how you sort of see yourself. And, and yeah, no, that's, a, I mean, I, that's wild. I, now I'm now i just sort of thinking to myself, because I'm trying to picture being in Berlin and, mm-hmm. and just having your hair in a state that you would just never do in your own country. Yeah. I mean, what does that yeah. say about the States, right? I know. <laughs> yeah. So that is crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. And, and, and then you even said about presentation, right? I mean, you, like I said, you're a darker skinned woman. Mm-hmm. Did your relationship with kind of how you saw your, your, your skin shape sort of change or was it just, did it shift being in Germany? Yeah. I mean, most of the black people here are dark skinned. So mm-hmm. you fit right in, in terms of color and, yeah, I feel like I definitely embraced myself more here. I don't feel as self-conscious 
about the shade of my skin, which is weird because mm-hmm. most people here are white, actually. But right, right. <laughs> it's not seen as, as a bad thing. I mean, I don't know. I, I it's I almost have to sit down and think about it. But I just feel more comfortable here in my skin, literally. <laughs> well, I, well, and I well, I think a big part of what you said earlier is that there's not an expectation, mm-hmm. right? There's just not an expectation. It's just, exactly. you're just, you're just who you are as a person. And so mm-hmm. that's, I think that's, that's super fascinating. And, and so even with that, so like, I, I, and we've talked about your husband, where did you even meet your husband? Cause he's German. So I'm actually very fascinated by this. Girl, <laughs> we, <laughs> we met on a dating site, uh, a European dating site called Parship. I'm not doing a plug for Parship. <laughs> You know what? Almost every, here's the thing. Let me not say like there's been millions and millions, but I have, I had another woman, dark skin, black woman, who met her, her, her European husband <laughs> on, well, I think at that time, I think I have no idea. Maybe Tinder had an international feature. It's, it, oh. they've been married a minute too. So this is like, or somebody, somebody had an international feature. Maybe it was I feel okay. like actually, I think it was before Tinder. Um, so yes. So yeah, I know it's okay. We're not plugging these dating sites. However, if it does work for you though, they can holler at me about some sponsorships and <laughs> we can, you know what? This is actually not a bad idea. <laughs> I might actually reach out to, so how well are you good at connecting internationals? Anyway, so you met on a European dating site. We did. And wh- where was he? Was he in Germany or outside of Germany or a different part of Germany? He was in Berlin at the time. Oh, mm-hmm. super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I love getting into like cross-cultural marriages and relationships. What's been the, uh, surprising is a hard word, but what's been the most interesting thing about marrying someone who's German, German? <laughs> Born and raised in Germany, I presume? Yeah, yeah. He, so he was raised in Kiel, Germany, which is in the northwest. It's near Hamburg. So it's a, it's a sailing city. And fun fact, they have the largest sailing competition in the world every year. So it, oh. it kind of draws the world to it, but he still had no experience with international people, let alone black people. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> God bless him. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he has learned a lot and a lot. Of, I know a lot of black women would say I would never marry outside of my race because they just don't understand. And I understand that. I do understand that. My thing with him was I needed to see, can he learn and understand at least where I'm coming from? How well can he learn and see my perspective? And that, I mean, he had already, before we met, he was already having contact with different people and stuff because he studied um, to be an English teacher as well. So he's had a lot of, as he got older, he started having more international contact. So that was my thing with him. He's a fast learner, <laughs> which was important. Good for him. And has he been to the States or has he been to any of these other places that you that you kind of came from? Like, has he been to New York or? He has. The, yeah. The first time was in 2019. We went to visit wow. my family. Yeah. 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 And then this past summer, we went again. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, I always yeah. get really excited for people when they go to places. This was the first time. Like, did he like did he like New York? He loved it. Of course. Loved it. <laughs> loved it. Was so excited. You know, this is the city you see on television right. you know, you're, all the time. So it was like, ooh. Like, yes, I'm in New York. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's expensive to live in though. <laughs> oh <my> goodness. <laughs> right. <laughs> that we can't do. Visit we can do. <laughs> does he, uh, do, do you cook at all? I do. I cook quite a bit, actually. I was going to say, do you make Trini food? Oh, I don't, just, I'm not, this is like so you're not, embarrassing. You're not your mama? I know, no, I don't know how to cook at that one, which is sad. It's <laughs> okay. It's sad. Okay, my sister's better than Kimberly. <laughs> I am. My sister kills it. I'm just like, <sighs> I can make a handful of things. Yeah. But it's no, not. not. I don't know. Do you know roti? Yeah. There used to be a roti shop in Berlin and it shut down before I got a chance to take him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <I'm> like, <really? laughs> and so then, okay. So literally I didn't, I didn't realize your husband was like born and raised in Germany. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's, 
So how do you find, because you guys have a little one now, do you find that with your parenting, parts of how you guys were raised kind of come up, like, you know, from your kind of American Trini background and his German background, or is it just you guys have sort of created your own space? Huh. I and I know she's little, us. so. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. I think we've created our own space. There doesn't seem to be that much cultural clash in terms of child rearing. It doesn't seem to be. He's generally more relaxed, but that's because, you know, moms are just kind of crazy. But that's not cultural. That's just, yeah. Personality. Yeah, Yeah. I think we're pretty unified with that, surprisingly, actually. Now that you ask me, I'm thinking about it for the first time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what is what is, what do I do that's very me and what's him and yeah. and do you I mean obviously because you're in his home country are in-laws nearby or are they far or they are back in his hometown so that's like a three or four hour drive away gotcha yeah, yeah. Do you ever go do you guys ever go back up to the sailing town yeah and they were just here last weekend actually um yeah. to see their their granddaughter their grandchild. Aww. yeah for the second time Aww. I mean, because of COVID, pandemic baby. So yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah. So they they don't speak English, so that's why okay. it's good that I can speak German. Because... Oh my gosh! And by the way, how long did it take you to learn German? Ooh. Okay. So I had to to extend a work visa. You have to show them that you've been making money. So learning the language was not a priority for me. Right. So it took me like a good solid five years, which is embarrassing. Yes. But what? then what? I learned it like slow and steady and in context, as opposed yeah. to learning it in a classroom with no context. Yeah. And I think that's the best way to learn a language. Immersion immersion like yeah at a certain point immersion i think is very helpful because then it's like okay i gotta use this instead of just a very rote and i understand that they try to be more dynamic but you're right so i mean yeah. i think five years is actually a really good time to like actually feel comfortable in no to be honest because some languages are harder than others and so so it said yeah it took me a couple of years mm-hmm. and considering there's so many people who live like i've met people in the netherlands for example i'll go back to that who have never learned dutch mm-hmm. live there. 10, 15 years. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I mean, at that point, I feel like if you don't live there that long, you might want to be in conversation. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So, that's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> and so I, I asked this of everyone, what do you, what do you like then at this point in, in this life? Cause you've been in, you've been in Germany for 10, 11 years. You obviously, you and your husband are building a family there. This is your, you're now working at the university level, correct? Yes. And are you a, are you a EU resident or a Jerp? Like, are you that? <laughs> What's your like citizen? I have permanent residency. Yeah. You can't in order. Okay. Generally speaking, in order to get German citizenship, you have to give up your U.S. citizenship. Ah, so they're one of those countries. Okay. Yeah, there is a loophole. It's a complicated loophole. I'm not going to get into it, but generally speaking, you have to give it up, and I am not doing that, especially with a child. And, you know, here's actually thank you for pointing that out, because I, you know, I had the opportunity to remain dual with Cameroon. And obviously, oh, good. you have to give it up, but you have to give it up when you turn 18. So I gave up the uh, American passport. Girl, please. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I know. I know. But 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 I think sometimes folks hear and think, OK, I could be dual, especially with Western countries. And it's a little bit easier. But I didn't realize with Germany that it is really like you German or you're not like they're generally not going to be doing a dual thing as you may hear with maybe the UK or somewhere else. And so for you, you've obviously made the decision to keep the American citizenship and your child, I guess she gets, she gets an option, doesn't she? Because you're American and dad's just, so She's what is she? Both. Okay. Mm-hmm. Can she keep both up to a certain point or no? I think she can. I, from what I understand, I think she can. I've heard no. I've heard yes. I gotta research some more. <laughs> so I don't know. Are you sure. <laughs> I mean, we know. I know she definitely has the American because she was born to an American. Exactly. So that that one will hold. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we, yes. Don't, we don't know what what the what the other side will do. And so, yeah. I mean, I think so. Where I was going with this question is that at this point, you've been in Germany for. 
once again, over a decade, Mm -hmm. this is your life. Do you, do you guys see yourselves ever moving anywhere or you feel like outside of Germany or you think, yeah, we're, we're probably here for the, for the long haul. Hmm. Good question. Uh, My husband has spoken more than once about possibly moving to the States for a while. (laughs) He's, he's, he's fascinated. Yeah. He's fa- <laughs> he is, he is. I'm like, oh, God bless him. He's fascinated. He the is. rest of us are like, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can if you want to. But, yeah. I'm but, like, <laughs> do you, you really? Sure? Yeah. <laughs> are you sure you want to do this? And then, and, and, and here, no, but I think it's an interesting th- thought because also, you know, it depends on where you live in the country. So, you know, the country, and you know, there's some places you don't want to live. And mm-hmm. is trying to explain to that person and the places you may want to live. Can you afford to live? There's a lot here. So, wow. Okay. Exactly. And so the social benefits. Move. Right? Girl. Because I don't know. I Like like I said, you can visit New York. I don't know if you could live in New York now at the stage of your life. Because I feel like people, once they leave New York City, who grew up there mm-hmm. and, or were there for a long time, it's hard for them to go back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. After a certain age, like it's hard. They're just like, this is, this is a lot. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, totally. so yeah. So he's yeah. thought about the States. Have you, has you, have you guys ever thought about anywhere else in Europe? No, actually not. <laughs> <laughs> not sorry. I feel like that's a very German, like, <laughs> why? I've been here for too long, honey. <laughs> right. I no, I love Germans. I feel like Germans are I honestly love Germans and, and Dutch girls because they are so direct. They are. Ooh. It is so funny to me how direct they are. Ooh. That that hurt, but they're like, but is it not so? I'm like, I know it's so, but you needed to I I live in the southern US where you gotta butter the person up before you hit them with the with the <laughs> high and the low. Yes. And I, I think it's funny when I meet New Yorkers who are like, these people are direct though. And I'm like, yeah. but for us, y'all are direct, but like these folks don't care about your feet. It's on another level. On another <laughs> level. <laughs> so like, I, you know, I could have, I, I mean, I don't know where, where I would imagine y'all would live elsewhere in Europe. And of course, opportunities come up and there could be this great opportunity in Sweden. <laughs> you guys could decide. You're like, no, <laughs> we could go to Sweden. too far north. <laughs> you like, we go to Sweden and yeah. So, yeah. so here's yeah. what I want to ask you, because I, I, I haven't done this in a while, but I thought it'd be super fun just in light of the fact that you've been in Germany for a while. I have these three rapid fire questions. So I, I ask folks, you don't have to think too hard. I, it's just like the first thing that comes off the top of your mind. Right. So. You've been in Germany for this long. What is one experience that you think that a newcomer should have once they get in Germany? And if it makes it easier, let's say Berlin. They should. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a, that's a really go see the Berlin Wall. I mean, this is. <laughs> this this is, is yeah, this is history totally that's still see. there. And the, his, the history of the city, there's so much history here. It's insane. So start with the wall. It's still there. Parts oh. of it, parts of it. <laughs> parts, of, parts of it, right. Not the whole thing. Or yeah. the purpose. Uh, second thing, what is an absolute must-have German dish? Not Berlin, but but German. Um, oh, um, that is a good question. Schnitzel, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> That's what all Americans think of when they think of Germany. I want to get some schnitzel. <laughs> right. I mean, I think of Ger- Germans... I- Beer and sausage. Yeah, yeah, beer, 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 beer is a big thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah if you're if you're a beer drinker, if you're a beer drinker, you're not, yeah, I'm you're not. not right. I'm like a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Third thing. What's one piece of advice that you would give now as someone who's gone through it for someone who would be relocating to Germany? What's one piece of helpful advice? Bring every single official document that you have from the time of birth. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> no joke. I, no joke. I, yeah, it'll come up later. And also don't discount, discount any experiences you've had that may seem random. They may come back later to help you. You never know. Oh, like a criminology degree. To yes. Yes. 
Yes, for example. <laughs> that is the so, so I'm sorry. This is the wildest thing I've heard someone say in a career context that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like, okay. <laughs> you never right. know. You never know. <laughs> Got you the job, so I can't be bad at that. That is amazing. <laughs> Vanessa, thank you so much for, <laughs> for this, for coming out to the podcast. <laughs> thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh my gosh. I I feel like I've learned a lot about Germany, especially in the last 20 minutes. But yeah. I I have appreciated your candor. And and for those of you who are following, as always, you can see the show notes that'll be up as well as visit the article we will have on our site that is attached to this episode. So as always, you can find us on theblackexpat.com and we will catch you later. Bye-bye. You just heard an episode of the Global Chatter podcast, a project by the Black Expat. It's hosted by me, Amanda Bates, and it's edited by Stephanie Fuccio. To learn more about this podcast or to learn more about the Black Expat, visit theblackexpat.com.